Hello everyone, wherever you are on the globe, and welcome to this uh, 18th edition of the International Conference on the Quality of Education. This year's theme is dedicated to highlighting key determinants for improving learning outcomes based on data analysis, analysis from Teams, Perls, and PISA. The conference aims to determine the blocks and levels of academic success by analyzing the variables having an influence on learning outcomes in education systems around the world. The main objectives of the conference are to understand the factors that influence learning outcomes and to propose scenarios to improve the quality of the education system. The papers to be presented will make it possible to achieve this, these objectives. For uh, 15 days, you will have the pleasure of following online policymakers, researchers and experts from 21 countries and five continents. The presentations will be spread over eight sessions and in each session, you will be able to chat with the guests by asking them questions live on Facebook, now Meta, YouTube and LinkedIn. Today I am pleased May Abu Nasser Naji, President of Amakin, to welcome you to the opening session of the Simclusive 18 conference, which will be reserved for internationally renowned policymakers. Our, our first guest in this special session is Mr. Oli Pekka Heinonen, the former Minister of Education in Finland and the current president of International Baccalaureate Organization. It's my great pleasure to welcome Mr. Oli Pekka Heinonen. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Thank you so much, President Nasi. Thank you for the invitation to come and talk on this conference uh, which has objectives which I think we all the different education systems around the world could and should share. Well, what are the ways that we can improve the quality of education, teaching and learning uh, and what are the kind of um, indicators and aspects that have an influence on learning outcomes. Th those Mr. Are Mr. Heinonen, the, the title of your presentation is Socioeconomic Factors that Impact Learning Outcomes. Please take 30 minutes to present and we will reserve 30 minutes for attendees to ask some questions. Thank you so much. Um, I, will, I will do that and I'm very happy to share with you um, the, the question of socioeconomical factors that impact learning outcomes. Um, and if we take the next slide um, I am going to go through uh, what, are, what, what are the kind of big challenges for our educational thinking the very big kind of paradigm shifts that might, we might be faced with then also some learnings of the COVID-19 what could and should we learn from that experience? And then I'm also going to use some very new data 
by OECD on the impact of social, um, social um, emotional skills on academic learning. And I would like to start with this question, which is something that I think we are all faced with. And that's the question that how can we educate and train in an uncertain and complex world for a future we can't predict? Um, education is about intergenerational transfer that what the earlier generations um, have to offer for the next generations, for the new generations um, to succeed in life. And kind of the history of education system has been history where we have thought that we know that what are the what is the knowledge that the new generation must have in order to be successful in life but as we have learned that in today's world the future does not seem to go kind of in a very linear um, way but there's a lot of uncertainty and complexity um, in, in the world for the time being. And that means that we have to kind of rethink that how that intergenerational transfer could happen. And that kind of brings us to the idea that the knowledge part is important also in the future, but it's not enough. But it's also the skills and the values and the attitudes which combine into competencies which really make the difference. So it's not only the things that what we know, but it's also the things that what we are able to do with what we know that becomes so important and in that we're talking about also the agency of the new generations to make a difference in the world and if we go to the next slide um, looking at the learnings of the COVID-19 it has been a a kind of a tough teacher for our education systems because um, it has shown us in a very concrete way that how complex and unpredictable the world is where we're living at and it has meant that um, the COVID-19 it has been definitely also an educational crisis um, and kind of um, a deepening the challenges of the learning crisis. So kind of um, the, the, the COVID-19 has meant that for certain countries and for certain schools and students, the learning has stopped for a long period of time. And of course, we have been being innovative in finding new ways of utilizing technology, for example, and also kind of finding new ways for teaching and learning in these times. The COVID-19 era has also kind of shown that there are some um, kind of vulnerabilities in our systems. And what we are seeing that those students who are from the beginning, the most vulnerable has been the ones that are suffering the most of this special um, kind of situation with the pandemic. And it has also shown that education is not only a service, 
but also the physical place, the school, the educational institution, the university plays a role because it's also that how you are part of that society that makes a difference. And I'll come back to that when I go into the um, uh, social emotional skills um, results done by, by OECD. If we take the next slide, I will go through some learnings and discoveries from the um, kind of experience from Finland that how the pandemic, um, what, what are the learnings that we have found in Finland? I think there's been um, kind of good sides in the Finnish context which show that in special circumstances the education system is still functioning and also the responsibility of the teachers and educators has been strong in those times. And we have also found out that how important the interaction between different actors, uh, the, the parents, the families, the schools, the social health authorities, um, how important that interaction has been also in these special times. And if the trust has been there, I think things have uh, been kind of functioning quite well. We have found that during the pandemic that how strongly the learning and well-being are linked together. So if there has been problems with the student's well-being, that has, has had a, diff, uh, a strong effect also on the learning part and on the learning outcomes. So it is something that the education system must uh, kind of take a lot of attention, not only kind of making sure that the learning is happening, but also making sure that the well-being of the students is taken care of. And I would say that that is something that is shared in all levels of the education system that it's not only something that is kind of connected to the primary education, but I would say that that's something that what we are seeing in the, in the university level also. So in that sense, there is a kind of a need for strength and the well-being support services that are available under all circumstances. Um, and, and that's kind of something that um, emphasizes the resilience of the whole education and learning system. And as I said, understanding the systemic uh, kind of character of the learning system is very central that it does not only include the teachers and the schools, but it must include the parents, it must include the, the kind of uh, social health sectors, the youth sector, the, the kind of NGOs that affect the, the kind of um, learning environment as a whole. And if we go to the next slide, it shows that we are on our way to a new culture in education. And I would say that the culture of the education becomes central. And there are four points that I would like to raise up here. And the first one is that we must develop the whole of the student, the whole human competence and agency, not only the knowledge and the matters that the students 
are learning. Another idea that I would like to stress uh, is that the children and the young people, the students, they must be seen as actors and leaders themselves who want to make a difference in the world and who are not only kind of objects of somebody else's action. If they can learn that type of a agency at a young age, that is something that will carry on for the rest of their lives. And as we are struggling, for example, with the challenges of the climate change, which is an issue which affects very strongly the future of those students. If it is so that we are able to show the students that how they, by their own actions, can make a difference to tackle the challenges of climate change, then we can kind of change that anxiety that there might be because of climate change in young people to action, to positive energy. But on the other hand, if we are not able to do that, there is the danger that climate change will kind of discourage the young people and they become very cynical and hopeless of their future. And that would be the most dangerous thing that we could see happening in our systems. The third point I would like to take up is that we must look at the education system as a kind of a collaborative network, a kind of a learning system where the different actors and their um, kind of um, their input in making the learning possible is strictly connected with one another. And that means also that schools cannot be isolated institutions in the society, but they must be connected to the other societal goals that there are. Going to the next slide, this is a kind of a very simple illustration by actually by uh, Sir Jeff Mulgan on the different dimensions of helping a child grow into humanity, that what kind of a challenge it is. And it shows that if we think about uh, raising up a child and the time that it takes, it's a long time. It is kind of at least kind of 10 to 15 years that it takes to help a child grow into humanity. It is also a challenge that involves a lot of different people and the help of different organizations. So socially, it's also a very challenging task. And when we are thinking about the cognitive challenge, we need the, the cognitive understanding from very different scientific disciplines, the pedagogical, the kind of developmental psychology, the, the kind of uh, cognitive base of different subjects, the medicine and so on to succeed in helping a child grow into humanity. And that shows that how a complex challenge this issue is. And here we are talking only about one child, but when we're talking about 
a whole education system, it is even a, a, a larger challenge. And that leads to me to the next kind of entity where I would like to go through this very recent results uh, done by OECD using the Andreas Leiher's pictures. Uh, in the next slide, you can see the, um, the survey that how it was done, because it was done uh, gathering the information from 10 different participating cities around the world with 3,000 students. And it has been looking at the social and emotional skills that how they correlate with certain issues. And as we are talking about, for example, um, the PISAR or TIMS or PEARLS data, that's kind of something that we have for the time being, but we have to also look that and, and start kind of thinking that what could be the future PISA? What are those learning outcomes that we should kind of measure and look after in the future? And I think OECD is here kind of showing us the, uh, the way that social and emotional skills are something that we should follow more carefully in the future. Then going to the results, um, the next slide shows that when we're looking at 15 year olds, um, some social emotional skills are very strongly positively re related to academic performance and others have a negative effect on that performance. The, the highest uh, kind of bar there that has positive uh, influence on academic performance is curiosity. So it seems that curiosity is something that is very strongly connected to the um, academic performance in different subjects and knowledge bases. Going to the next slide, um, there, the, the survey has this kind of outcome, which I think it's very interesting that um, when compared 10 year olds and 15 year olds, the 10 year olds report higher levels of almost all social and emotional skills. So from 10 to 15 years, uh, those skills as students themselves report are kind of getting worse. And that's not only what the students are saying, but that's the same thing what parents are saying and what also educators are saying. So there is something happening from 10 to 15 that makes that change happen. Of course, the, the world from 10 year old to 15 year old becomes much, much more complex and much, much more challenging kind of in social and emotional um, skills wise to function there. So that could be one reason, but there might be other reasons also that I think should be studied. And what's also interesting is that this drop from 10 to 15 is bigger for girls than it is for boys. Going to the next slide, here you can see that creativity is a skill that has very strong positive impact on other social and emotional skills. 
So creativity is some kind of a, a, a special uh, skill um, w which has wider impact. And it's also going to the next slide that interesting to see that in creativity there is quite strong kind of dropping levels when students grow older. And it is interesting that when in the same survey it was also asked that how the kind of arts and sports hobbies um, develop from 10 year old to 15 year olds, there was also a drop on, on the arts and sports hobbies. So 15 year olds don't anymore kind of do so much arts and sports than 10 year olds uh, did. Going to the next one, uh, the feeling of belonging is very central um, and, and strongly connected to the higher level of uh, social and emotional skills. That the stronger the feeling of belonging is, the, the better the, the um, it, it is kind of predictive of, of higher social and emotional skills. And I think this comes back to the issue of how the school culture is functioning. That it is really something that um, the, the students feel that they belong to that school community. They are wanted there. They have a voice that they are listened to and supported. Um, and, and that is kind of a, a, an issue that has an impact on the um, social and emotional kind of skills outcomes and through that also on the academic learning outcomes. And then going to the next one, um, of course, one thing that has an effect on the belonging is the question that how much bullying there is uh, in schools. And um, these are the 10 year olds and the levels come from 10 to 20 percent uh, of students that are feeling um, certain kind of bullying happening there. These are quite high numbers and of course when there is this bullying happening the the feeling of belonging to the school community cannot be on a very high level. Actually what is very challenging is that there are other surveys that are showing that when we're talking about feelings of anxiety and also kind of tri trauma type of, of feelings among two students, they might um, come up to the 40 percentage level of students, which are kind of alarmingly high numbers um, that, that th those surveys are showing. Then going to the next one, uh, which I think it's quite natural, connected again to the belonging issue, that if the student-teacher relationship is a, is a functioning one that is, has a correlation with the improved social and emotional uh, skills. And then going forward, um, the, the next slide, um, the, the kind of outcome is that uh, those students who are more stress resistant have an optimistic mind check and feel 
energetic. They indicate a higher psychological well-being amongst 15 year olds. And as I was starting my presentation with that uh, the well-being, the feeling of well-being has a strong correlation also with the learning outcomes. Uh, and, and that kind of shows that the, the social and emotional skills should not be seen as something, as a kind of a byproduct of education, but they are something at the very core of teaching and learning. We have for such a long time spoken about the 21st century skills um, in our education discourse, but I think the gap is still too long from the talk about 21st century skills and how we include those skills in our everyday teaching and learning. How do we make it possible for teachers to explicitly and implicitly include that type of skills in the teaching and learning practices. I think we, as a uh, education professionals, we have a lot to do on that front. So thank you very much for your time and attention and very much looking forward to hearing your comments and taking part in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Heinonen, for this excellent presentation. We have uh, many questions from participants, and please answer a few. The first uh, question, you said in your presentation that schools are not isolated institutions in the society, and teaching and learning need to connect with other societal goals. Don't you find that this will add further responsibilities to the school, which for it is not prepared, especially in developing countries? Yes, thank you. I think that's a, that's a very important question. And, and I understand the basic motivation for the, this, for, for the question. And I think we should not only kind of uh, see that that would mean that it would kind of burden the teachers and schools more uh, than what is the situation today. But we could also see it the other way around, that how can we find the support from the wider society to, to really support the teaching and learning happening in the schools. That how can we um, get the help from social and health professionals, for example, to schools, which is the kind of place for young people to be present that makes the well-being possible and how also those professionals could not only kind of help the individual students but how could they support the whole school community to better understand uh, the needs and kind of tools to make the kind of social and health well-being of the students as good as possible. So I'm kind of seeing it in that sense that um, it, it's a way also to get wider support from the society to that important tasks that 
the, our schools are responsible of? Uh, we are we are comments from Leila Ubnaisa. Uh, curiosity is more than just soft skill, and it is not skill either. Um, that that's an interesting question, and and we are at the IB. Actually, for the time being, we are doing a a research project with the Jacobs Foundation on on kind of two area we are looking at curiosity and we are looking at creativity and kind of kind of deconstructing what is behind uh, those um, kind of um, words and also that how to be able to include um, those into the teaching and learning in the everyday life of schools. And of course, we can also kind of um, discuss about the nature of, for example, curiosity. And again, I understand the, the, the kind of argumentation behind uh, that skill, but I think that curiosity involves also aspects uh, that can be strengthened through the means of education. Are you agree with the Ritzabin Kiran uh, who says that everything is explained thanks to neuroscience findings? Um, I think the neurosciences do have a lot to, or we have a lot to learn as educators from the, the newest uh, findings of, of, of neurosciences. Um, and, and, and I think that um, I'm a very kind of, I'm not saying that I have the right answers. I think we are all learning all the time and, and I'm very happy to, to kind of um, learn of those newest research outcomes that there are. Another question. As you said, we will move from a hierarchical system towards collaborative networks in which the role of government is to show the way. Is it in phase with the decline of democracy in many countries? Um, can, can I hear the last sentence again? Is it... Is it in phase with the decline of democracy in many countries? Um, well, well the, the way I see it... Uh, is that, um, how would I put it? It, 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 is, it is kind of giving more agency also to the best experts who are affecting the teaching and learning in the system. And I think that as kind of uh, kind of democracy is something that there must be trust in the society for democracy to function well. Uh, and trust to me consists of kind of three elements. There must be intimacy, uh, the closeness of different actors for the trust to be created. So, for example, the, the national um, education authorities should be close enough to the reality of schools so that the schools can feel that they understand our problems and, and they are, in that sense, capable of helping 
us achieve the the kind of targets that we have in the education system then there is the the um, credibility um, w which is something that that you have the skills and competencies to take care of those tasks that you are responsible of and and then there is the reliability that you keep up what you promise and and i think that for that reason that the networking character of the education system becomes so more important uh, because it's also the best way to be more agile when there's a lot of kind of changes and uncertainties in in our societies so so i think it is something that um, kind of all societies are faced with with this kind of of, of challenges, um, and and it could be a way also to strengthen the democratic basis of a society. Uh, social and emotional skills are a subset of an individual's abilities and characteristics important for individual success and social functioning. In what age the learner has to master these skills? Can I again hear the last part? In what age the learner has to master these skills? Mm. That's a difficult question and, and I, 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 I cannot kind of say a special age um what i would like to say that i think that what we are learning all the time more is that how special the the ages of of kind of uh, uh kind of uh puberty is in a child's life that that those couple years of of um kind of turning into adolescence that that there are very special things happening in a in a student's life during those years and 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 it must be kind of very strongly understood also in the education system um, I would say that um, actually the, the social and emotional skills are something that they should develop, they, they should be kind of an objective of a lifelong learning also, that they are not something that we get ready at certain age, but actually we have the possibility to develop ourselves also during our adult years, uh, and 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 that's the kind of one of the good things of the of the neuro um, um, neuro kind of sciences telling about us the the kind of the plastic and elastic um, kind of character of the brains that it is something that there it doesn't stop when we don't get any taller uh, in height in height but it continues uh throughout the whole life on average socioeconomically advantaged students reported higher social and emotional skills than their socioeconomically disadvantaged peers in all cities how can school become more equitable that that's that that's a very difficult question um I would say that in becoming more equitable, I would stress the importance of the early childhood education. Because 
those are the years when also the skills, how to learn to learn, uh, are developing quite fast. And that is the moment where there is a possibility to um, kind of create more equal starting point for all children. So I think, I think the, the early childhood education could play a bigger role than, than I think we have understood earlier in, in, in reaching the equal goals of our systems. Zakaria uh, Humana, a practice co-design and creative workshop and the impact of for small groups is huge in terms of understanding the main ideas and designing self-made learning. How can traditional ways of education start the change? Uh, yes, I, I think again that question goes to a, a, a very deep level that how we understand learning and uh, and kind of um, I see that what becomes more and more important all the time is something that like Michael Fulham for example calls talks about the deep learning meaning that uh, there is a strong connection um, in that learning situation um, with the learner and the content what is learned. So um, in a way, um, th there's a strong kind of motivation, inner motivation created in that situation for the learner to acquire something new. And when that happens, then the learning actually becomes part of the identity of that person. So it is not something in those cases that you just take a test and then you forget what you have learned, but it is something that stays with you um, as you grow older and you build your identity on top of that. And, 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 and that's a huge change uh, on, 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 on very kind of traditional ways of, of seeing education. And, and kind of the understanding that how, what are the things that are meaningful for students and creating that motivation of that learning process. I think that becomes a central kind of skill of teachers. Um, and, and, and again, it is a different type of identity for the teachers that has been the traditional one. So, so I think in that sense, we, we, we are needing um, quite a big change in, in our way of seeing education, teaching and learning. And, and we really need that type of, of innovative kind of experimenting and piloting that was referred in the question. Uh, comments from Rita Kiran. Creativity can be developed all life thanks to neuroplasticity, but curiosity triggers creativity. Exactly. I agree. Yes. A question from Leila Ognaisa. Would curiosity also be linked to some cultural practices? Yes, I think so. Um, that, that's a very interesting question. Because um, it's also the question that are our cultures uh, kind of supporting curiosity 
to be kind of strengthened and, and created that if there is a how would I say what what um, what, what, what uh, Dirk calls the, the, the concepts of, of kind of fixed mindset and the growth mindset um, that if there's a culture which values strongly the ideas of a fixed mindset that we see that there are kind of right and wrong answers and the the idea that you have to be ready uh, and know always the the right answers um, to to kind of succeed that is a culture that could kind of um, kind of harm the development of curiosity and on the other hand if there is a strong kind of growth uh, mindset in the culture seeing every moment a new possibility to learn something new also take risks and and, and also kind of see that uh, challenges in one's lives are opportunities again to learn new things that type of a cultural approach i think can strongly support the creation of of uh, curiosity and creativity another question maybe the last levels of creativity and curiosity were significantly lower among 15 year olds compared to 10 year olds to what extent schools are responsible for this situation hmm. i would say that that's a very painful question um to be to be answered that are our school practices such that they discourage uh, the, the the social emotional skills to be developed uh, and and again i would come back to the kind of question of, of the fixed and growth mindset that do our school cultures and education systems do they are they really built on growth mindset or are they still kind of um looking for the only for the right answers not the process of learning something new and also the different ways to coming to come into the uh, solutions uh, and the answers um, uh, I, I think we should kind of have the mirror in front of us as educators and as kind of education systems all the time to, to really kind of be honest when answering that question Thank you so much, Mr. Heinonen, for your participation in Simclusive 18. And I hope we can, wel we can welcome you another time in Morocco. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure to take part. And thank you for the excellent questions. Thank you again. And you, dear viewers, do not forget the rest of our program today at uh, six o'clock past uh, 30 uh, we were welcome uh, the former minister of education in france madame najat valo belkassem qui va présenter faire une présentation en français cette fois donc à tout à l'heure see you later Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.